Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Electricity Wildfire Mitigation Webinar Series. We are so pleased to have all of you here with us again today. I'm Meredith Brasselman with ICF and our team is going to be guiding you through the webinar today and throughout the webinars the rest of the month. As always, we have a few housekeeping items before we get started. Please note that this WebEx call is being recorded and will be posted on the Department of Energy's website and may be used internally. If you do not wish to have your voice recorded, please do not speak during the call. If you do not wish to have your image recorded, please turn off your camera and participate by phone. If you speak during the call or use a video connection, you are presumed consent to recording and use of your voice or image. If you have any technical issues today or questions, you may type them in the chat box and select to send to our host. Your lines have been muted and they will remain muted throughout the webinar. We are taking questions today though. You may submit your questions throughout the presentations, but we're going to hold them till the end uh, and have all of our pancel, pan panelists answer together. So to submit your questions, you can put them in the chat and again, select to send to the host from the drop down menu. If you will please also reference either the speaker's name or the topic when you submit, that will help us make sure it gets to the right panelist at the end. And finally, if you need to view live captioning, please refer to the link that will appear in the chat panel. So to get us started today, I am pleased to welcome Michael Pesson, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Advanced Grid and Research and Development for the Office of Electricity. Michael, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction and welcome to the second webinar, webinar in our series of wildfire mitigation series. So I want to talk about the role of my division and the Office of Electricity. So the role of the Advanced Grid Research and Development Division is to focus on the ways to address the changes facing the nation's electric power grid. Our main effort is to ensure that the nation's energy delivery system is secure, reliable, and that enables the administration's decarbonization goals. Grid transmission and distribution innovations, smarter ways to control, convert, and deliver electricity, are the key is in unlocking cleaner, more affordable, and resilient energy future. So this resilient enabled grid will help us to maintain the reliability, equity, and connectivity that is vital for societal advancement. Whether the grid is powering manufacturing, the essential health services, or our computers and communications, it goes largely unnoticed except until when it fails. Recently, investments in the grid have focused on improving its reliability, efficiency, and resilience to meet growing dependence on electricity across all sectors. To serve our expectations of continuous access to electricity, a collection of generators, towers, wires, transformers, switches, and poles were erected and stitched together. In addition to the physical infrastructure, a centralized control system was developed where large remote generators are coordinated and dispatched to ensure the reliable delivery of electricity to end users through the network of high voltage transmission lines and medium voltage distribution systems. However, the electric power system is undergoing a dramatic structural transformation on both generation and loads, and this vast complex machine will require significant re-engineering. It will need it to meet all new demands that are outside of what this electric grid would initially ask to do when it was designed over 100 years ago. One of the big challenges is how do we accommodate all this change over the existing transmission and distribution system? In, ad in addition, administration has very ambitious goals of 100% clean power sector by 2035 and net zero economy by 2050. There is a lot of work that needs to be done and is continued to be done on generation side, so solar, wind, and continued energy efficiency improvement and electrification of loads. However, on the delivery side, the operational philosophy of the grid is largely the same as it was 50 or 60 years ago. So how do we accomplish this while maintaining grid reliability? Clearly, industry-wide coordination is essential, not just technology, but planning, operations, and markets. I always say that technology cannot succeed on its own. For new technologies to succeed, you need to have markets that support this technology. And for markets to succeed, you need to have the right policy in place. 
This is the three legs of the same stool, policy, markets, and technology working together to realize a shared vision of the modernized grid. So one of the big success stories in the recent years that our office, office uh, participated was the deployment on synchro phasers. We spearheaded the deployment of thousands of the sensors throughout the country. And that was done in the response of 2003 Northeast blackout. It provided significant improvement in high level situational awareness. However, this is no longer enough. We need to have much higher fidelity and visibility on real time grid conditions. We are now providing new investments that support development of dynamic line ratings to help system operators determine accurately and reliably the current carrying capacities limits of transmission lines, which can improve reliability and resilience by providing grid operators with enhanced situational awareness of individual assets. So last week, the webinar series explored the sensing and detection capabilities provided by Oak Ridge, uh, as well as fire testing from Sandia National Labs. Today's webinar will build on that education and dive into situational awareness capabilities. So we are pleased to have experts from Argonne, Oak Ridge, PNNL, and Sandia National Labs. While we're highlighting the lab's capabilities, we understand that many utilities and other government agencies are working on their own solutions to mitigate wildfires. And we are very interested in hearing from you about what are you working on. So please reach out to us uh, and we will be, we would love to hear from you so we can work all together. Uh, you'll have contact information at the, on the final slide of this webinar. Our hope is that you'll find capabilities that will work for you and that we will be able to connect with our labs to help mitigate wildfires together. So thank you for your time and enjoy the webinar. Thank you so much, Michael. We appreciate you being here with us today. So now it's time to hear from our colleagues at the National Labs. Today, you'll hear from Feng Chu and Brett Hansert from Argonne National Laboratory, Aaron Myers, Jitu Kumar, and Gotham Thakior from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, David Judy and Dan Corbiani from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and Ken Armijo from Sandia National Laboratories. As a reminder, you are welcome to submit your questions in the chat box sent to the host, and we're going to hold questions until the end, so please reference the speaker or topic when you submit your questions. So let's take a deeper dive into the situational awareness capabilities provided by Argonne National Laboratory. We are pleased to welcome Feng Chu from Argonne to discuss its multi-source, multi-time scale wildfire data warehouse and visualization platform. Feng, you have the ball. Hello. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? We sure can. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, I also turned on my uh, video, but uh, not sure if it's working now. But anyway, uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to share uh, some of the work on the uh, wildfire uh, research. And, you know, wildfire research is uh, uh, one of the topics uh, that uh, uh, very much relies on industry practice. So uh, your uh, inputs, uh, suggestions, comments are uh, highly appreciated. <clears throat> and if you find some of this part of the talk is interesting to you, uh, just please free um, to reach out to me. All right, so I would just first give an overview about this line of research uh, and then uh, we are going to talk about the first part. Uh, there are two uh, other presentations in the next week. Um, so the whole purpose of this uh, uh, research is to uh, better understand the uh, wildfire risk. Uh, for example, uh, what are the contributing factors for wildfire? Uh, and uh, can we predict, can we come up with a, a formula uh, such that when you give me a uh, condition, I can uh, give you a number indicating the risk, right? And so after you understand the risk better, uh, how can we in incorporate this uh, understanding into uh, your operation and planning decision? For example, uh, can we do a better uh, public safety uh, power shut uh, operations so that, uh, you know, they be the outreach, uh, outage uh, hours can be um, reduced? Uh, or, you know, in the planning uh, uh, stage, how you can in incorporate this risk so that uh, you might design your 
uh, tr transmission uh, or distribution grid uh, a little bit different, right? Um, so uh, this talk is about the first part. So we need data, right? Uh, we need a lot of data. So what kind of, uh, uh, let me just uh, give you a uh, brief uh, uh, introduction to the feature here. And so this is the first, this is the data management system uh, with uh, a bunch of uh, programs that uh, automatically uh, grab data from different sources and then uh, do the computing, uh, processing, computing, uh, uh, storing. And also we have a visualization platform that, you know, convert all the information uh, into pictures and then uh, send to the uh, web browser uh, for uh, uh, presentation, visual presentation. And the potential uh, users, uh, you know, uh, we know uh, a lot of the utilities on the West Coast, uh, you know, uh, the wildfire pre prevention is a, a big part of their business. And they have a very uh, sophisticated application. They have a lot of data. Uh, certainly, you know, we're not uh, trying to duplicate the work there or competing with them. Um, but we know that there are also a, a lot of other uh, utilities, you know, uh, they don't have this dedicated, uh, you know, wildfire application. So uh, we hope that, uh, you know, uh, some of this uh, uh, tools we developed that could be useful there. And also, you know, if you are a community uh, stakeholder or if you are an instructor uh, developer, uh, you may want to uh, take a look at the fire potentials in the area you, you want to uh, start your project, right? And also uh, research communities, um, uh, we hope that uh, we can uh, provide this uh, um, uh, one-stop uh, shopping uh, so that, you know, you can uh, get all the data you need it. And so what data we have here now? Uh, here is a file, uh, fire triangle um, that illustrates uh, uh, the major contributing factors uh, to a wire fire. So we have a... Uh, Weather here, we have wind speed, temperature, humidity, uh, precipitation, and uh, other things. And also you have fuel. So this fuel provides, you know, the materials. Um, and normally the weather and the fuel uh, are lumped together uh, into so-called a fire danger index. Um, and the third thing in the uh, fire triangle is the, uh, the power delivery your device, right? That might start ignition, right? So these are three types of uh, input data we have. Uh, in addition, we also have uh, the fire incident rep report. So if you want to do more in-depth analysis, uh, you'd better to, you know, look at the uh, uh, fire incident report and see uh, if you can discover any pattern there. All right, so these are the uh, major category of data. So let's first look at the fire danger indices. So the fire danger indices uh, provide an estimation for the fire that uh, naturally occurs. Um, it's, it's, so our fo focus is on the you know fire caused by the power delivery, but you know the naturally occurred fire, you know those conditions, those uh, contributing factors is also important in our study. And so um, a lot of uh, agencies they develop a, a different type of uh, fire. Uh, danger indices, uh, for example, the weather forest and the, the US uh, FS, uh, and some uh, utility company also have their own fire indices. And they uh, normally take two kind of uh, inputs. One is the weather variables, the other is the environmental variables. So they lump them together according to some formula. And some of the fire indices is for like long term, uh, yearly, seasonally, and some of the four, like uh, they had a forecast. And so one of the common things in, in the uh, fire indices is that uh, it's based on the uh, uh, observation from the weather station, which uh, does not have very good coverage. So uh, what Argon, uh, in Argon, uh, the environmental science people have improved this index uh, so that it can provide a, uh, better coverage and uh, you know, better resolution. And we have, a uh, uh, either the uh, indices from the uh, the a number of agencies and also from uh, our own calculation. All right, and uh, and also uh, if you are a planner, 
uh, for your infrastructure, then uh, you probably care about uh, you know uh, what happened in uh, in the next 50 years, right? So uh, in Argon, our environment science people uh, have calculated this uh, uh, future climate projection and uh, take out the var uh, variables from those the projections and calculate the fair index. And and you can see here as an example, uh, these are the uh, uh, KBDI is one of the uh, drought index. Um, this calculated for uh, late uh, 21st century, and you would notice that uh, you know in uh, uh, southeast uh, and the Midwest the uh, U.S., um, which traditionally are not considered uh, you know fire risk region, uh, in the future it will have a significant number of more days uh, with hotter and a drier uh, weather. So that might you know give more fire potential in this region so this is a, a very helpful you know uh, for a long-term planning all right and the next type of data are vegetation type um so i'm not sure how many time do i have all right <clears throat> okay so we're good uh, the, uh, okay thank you thank you and uh, the vegetation you know provided the fuel uh for the fire uh, there are uh, different uh, ways to categorize the vegetation type. Some of them, uh, you know, um, focus more on the developed um, or undeveloped areas, and some of them, you know, focus on the plant plant type. And if you are doing uh, in-depth analysis, uh, you know, this could be your uh, input feature. So we have a connect a, a, a number of this vegetation type. And also we have a uh, uh, weather and the climate uh, variables and there are a number of uh, variables has already been identified uh, as uh, highly relevant to wildfires. For example, the uh, wind speed, uh, relative humidity, uh, the temperature, uh, precipitation, the moisture from the air or uh, from the uh, soil and also uh, geopotential haze. So, and also an, an, a lot of other uh, variables um, there. And also we pro not only provided the uh, weather variables for now, but also uh, the variables uh, in the future uh, climate projections. All right, uh, <clears throat> so the fire incident re report, uh, so far we only uh, have the uh, fire incident reports from the California region. Uh, basically from uh, uh, PG&E, uh, SCE, and uh, SDGE. Uh, we hope uh, we can find more um, fire incident reports. Um, if you have this kind of information and you would like to share, uh, you know, please uh, feel free to reach out to us. And this uh, uh, report uh, includes a number of information, for example, uh, date, time, um, location, uh, fire size, and also it has the, the cause like equipment of failure, or the contact from animals, or contact from vegetation. So this is very uh, useful if you want to categorize or if you want to find the uh, association, you know, of the fire with the environmental variables. And last thing is the power uh, infrastructure. Uh, so uh, we only have a transmission grid here, which uh, you can download from the EIA website. Uh, and, but, you know, most of the wildfire happened in the detrimental uh, system, but we don't have that uh, data. Um, but if you have the data, you can uh, plug into this tool and uh, uh, carry out the analysis. All right, so here is the flow chart for uh, the data flow and the visualization uh, part. Uh, the leftmost are the uh, database uh, located outside. We have the USGS, LOA, EIA, uh, and other resources. <clears throat> and uh, we have program uh, regularly uh, download this data to uh, our local server. And uh, some of them will be processed uh, in the computer, for example, the fire danger index, and some of them will be stored there. And after that, uh, uh, we have a program to take all this information and generate uh, an many, many uh, uh, small pictures, and uh, that will be used uh, finally for the visualization uh, purpose. All right, 
So here is a very, uh, okay, so the picture is not moving here. So this is supposed to be a uh, animation. Uh, so here is the uh, visualization uh, result. Uh, if you can see this uh, branch, this, uh, sorry. Okay, so if you see this branch, these are the transmitting grids uh, with the calculated power flow. And, and then we have this uh, fire potential index, which is one of the fire danger index. And so if you overlay these two layer, you probably can uh, discover something. I mean, I'm not an operator, but if you are, uh, you probably can uh, discover something. And of course, you can have your own uh, definition of uh, you know, fire risk, for example. If you think of wind is uh, the critical uh, factors here, uh, maybe you can uh, uh, overlay the uh, wind variables layer uh, together with this uh, uh, power uh, topology. And also maybe you could add another layer of uh, you know, vegetation, right? So uh, we believe that uh, this is the first step to, to uh, analyze the, the risk for humans. Uh, the visualization is the best way to you know, just get started. And we have more uh, in-depth uh, uh, analysis uh, using statistical methods and the uh, stochastic uh, uh, progress model. Uh, so that, that would be the uh, next uh, two uh, presentations next week. And, and so the, this is only part of the uh, work on uh, welfare in Argon. So this uh, uh, work is coordinated by our uh, grid uh, program lead. And we have people from uh, the energy system division or the and also uh, environmental science division. And uh, so we uh, also have an industry advisory board, uh, Southern California Edison. We really appreciate their uh, work, uh, their support. We meet them uh, regularly and they provide uh, valuable information. We uh, thank them very much. And also uh, all this work, uh, most of this work are supported by Argon LDRD uh, funding. And I think that there's acknowledgement page, but it's not here. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, all I want to talk about. If you um, have any suggestion, uh, maybe you find, hey, this does not make sense, or you feel, hey, this might be useful, uh, or if you have some data you would like to ask to, you know, take a look uh, with you, uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to me. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Feng. We appreciate all of that information. Now we're going to turn it over to Brett Hansert, also of Argonne, to talk about risk and crisis communication for wildfire response. So, Brett, you have the ball, and the floor is yours. All right, wonderful. Hey, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Brett Hansert with Argonne National Laboratory. I appreciate the opportunity very much to uh, speak with you today. I know uh, time is short, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of jump right into this presentation. Uh, so I'm the manager of a uh, training and exercise program at Argonne that focuses on emergency public information. Uh, basically, how we communicate with the public and media before, during, and after a crisis, and how as responders we communicate with each other, both internally and, uh, and with our external partners. Uh, what we do isn't specifically targeted to wildfires. Um, you know, but the capabilities we offer are vital to a successful wildfire response. Uh, from our perspective, in any kind of disaster or emergency, uh, information is as important as uh, food, water, and shelter. Uh, and that's definitely true for wildfires, uh, perhaps even more so. So I'll talk uh, about the points in this slide a little bit as we go forward and about some of the uh, training and exercise considerations that are unique uh, to wildfire planning and response from an, from an emergency public information perspective. Uh, this slide simply gives you a uh, quick overview of some of the different organizations and agencies we're currently working with. Uh, wildfires have been a, a particular focus in recent years for many of our sponsors like DOE and NSA, the Chemical Stockpile Program, which all have uh, sensitive facilities in high risk fire areas. Uh, we also have an ongoing uh, project with FEMA on how to communicate effective alerts and warnings, which is um, also a major interest for uh, state and locals with wildfire hazards. 
Um, our, our, our training program offers a, um, a wide variety of emergency public information and uh, public information uh, training topics, both virtually and in person. Uh, studies on communication consistently show that public affairs is much, much more than just media relations, which is still what a lot of people consider to be the primary job of the uh, public information officer. Uh, but we really strive to take a more holistic approach and, and look at all the elements that go into successful sunny day and uh, emergency communications. Um, at the bottom of this slide, you'll see a link where you can download a copy of our course catalog and see the uh, listings and descriptions in a little more detail. Uh, this slide shows some of the different uh, topical areas that our training encompasses. Uh, for the first area, public affairs, we offer courses for both uh, leadership and full-time communicators, including a course to help uh, senior managers better understand and appreciate the important role of the PIO. In the uh, risk and crisis communication area, we get into the science and methodology behind effective communication. Uh, and media relations is about engaging directly with the news media. Uh, for the social media, digital communication, and public information technology areas, uh, we look at the countless new ways in which information is disseminated, consumed, and monitored, which have provided incredible new opportunities uh, for both the sender and receiver, but has also pose major challenges as well for, uh, for the emergency management community. Uh, and finally, exercises and drills. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute as a way to create a uh, challenging and realistic environment to practice decision making and improve, um, improve your response planning. So when we think about critical communication capabilities for a wildfire response, there are some key areas to consider uh, with some of the most relevant courses listed here. Uh, the idea of a joint information system, a joint information center is, is how the various response agencies, local, state, and federal uh, will come together and work with each other. Uh, you know, by its nature, a wildfire response usually involves multiple agencies at all levels of government, you know, and their ability to coordinate emergency public information across jurisdictional lines is, is, is absolutely critical. Uh, we like to say as PIOs that uh, our job is to get the right information to the right people at the right time. Uh, so they can make the right decisions, uh, reaching vulnerable populations uh, and dealing effectively with misinformation and disinformation uh, can be the difference between at risk populations getting or not getting uh, the information that they need. Uh, that vulnerable populations course actually was developed by someone who worked in the Tubbs fire in California in 2017 as a uh, 911 dispatcher and, and she saw firsthand uh, the problems experienced uh, in that event by vulnerable populations. Uh, in addition to spokesperson training, which really you know, is about allowing communicators to, uh, to go on camera with messages that answer those three critical questions. Uh, what happened? What are you doing about it? And what does it mean to me? Uh, there are some other courses here, social media for situational awareness, uh, social media monitoring and reporting, uh, GIS tools, live stream technology that leverage the ability to uh, directly engage with the media and public in real time during an emergency. Uh, that go live course also came out of the Tubbs fire. It was developed by a uh, PIO who worked in the Santa Rosa City EOC uh, producing live stream videos. Uh, one of the other areas we're actively involved in is in providing technical assistance to state and locals for alerts and warnings through a program with FEMA. Uh, the increasing frequency, intensity, duration of weather events, including wildfires, uh, has highlighted uh, that what protective actions people take or don't take uh, really do have enormous consequences for their health and safety. Uh, we know that alert and warning messages that the public receives, understands and responds to will save lives, uh, but there are many challenges that emergency managers face in issuing those alerts and warnings. Uh, you can see some of the case studies we've done that are included as part of this technical assistance. Uh, we saw in the campfire, for example, that uh, where emergency phone calls alerting Paradise residents to evacuate failed to reach more than a third of those who had signed up for the local warning system. Uh, in the Gatlinburg fire, where an EAS message to announce uh, the city's evacuation didn't go out because power outages prevented uh, that message from being verified. Uh, and the Oroville Dam spillway evacuation, where the order to evacuate almost 200,000 people caused uh, hours of bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. 
So the the audience for these are are, are those folks who are directly involved in in issuing alerts and warnings, uh, emergency managers, PIOs, social media communicators. Uh, right now, these sessions are being done virtually, uh, with a heavy emphasis on peer to peer engagement and information sharing. Uh, and like all the training that we do, uh, the course materials continue to evolve as new resources and case studies are, are built into the program and, and shared with participants. So I just want to shift gears just a little bit. The, the primary purpose of my presentation is to talk about training, but I also want to mention our mock media exercise support because it's a, it's a very unique thing that we do. And it plays an important role in testing and validating emergency public information capabilities and in helping to identify training needs. So our goal in this regard is pretty straightforward. It's to create a challenging and realistic exercise environment so agencies can see what's working and, and where they need to improve. Uh, we use a virtual uh, training platform called the Exercise Training Network or ETN. Uh, that's a secure password protected site where players in an exercise or drill uh, can see what the media or, uh, would be reporting in an emergency and then respond as they would in a real event. And then on this slide, it's a, it's a view of that ETN dashboard. Uh, this is from a virtual exercise we did in Kentucky uh, last year. Uh, in a typical exercise, we would usually produce about two dozen mock media news stories, <clears throat> a mix of uh, radio, print, and video. Uh, we de develop all of these stories in real time uh, based on uh, direct interactions with players uh, through phone calls, interviews, media briefings, news conferences, anything that we can do to gather information like, uh, like the real media would. Uh, in, ad in addition to the news stories, we also simulate social media uh, to show what the media and public would be saying on social media platforms and to give players a chance to practice using social media platforms as well. So I was going to show a short clip here, but I have a feeling that hey, might not have made Brett, it in. Yes. Yeah, Brett, what we're going to do is we're going to take control here. We'll show the videos. Just let us know when you want to go to the next uh, slide. And also Perfect. for folks who have dialed in on your phones, you are not going to be able to hear any audio for the next couple of slides. But when you do view this later on, you'll be able to see the videos. So, Brett, I'll hand it back to you to chat. Oh, okay. Thanks. And this is a, this is a quick. Uh, this is just a one a, an example of one of those mock media news reports that we would reproduce in an exercise. And this one was done as part of an annual exercise we did in uh, Colorado a couple of years ago. You can go ahead and play. All right, there we go. I'm not hearing that audio. I'm not sure if anybody else. Um, we are not either. But again, once folks see this a little bit later on, they will be able to hear and see it. Okay. Well, you, you guys kind of get a, a flavor of, you know, so these are these are simulated news reports that are part of an exercise and it's really designed to kind of kind of bring that realistic flavor uh, to the uh, to the uh, exercise scenario and give players kind of something tangible and real to uh, react to and respond to. So the, the next slide is, is one more one more video and I'm not sure if we're gonna have the same problem there. Um, but it's an example of a, um, it's, a, it's, a it's a virtual studio that we developed uh, last year to practice live remote interviews. And yeah, again, we're not, we're not hearing the audio, but I, you know, I'm, I was really excited about this because this one, uh, parallels a lot of the trends that we're seeing uh, in the real world, particularly uh, during the pandemic where uh, these kinds of interviews really became the norm. So again, creating that experience, creating that environment for players to practice something that's going to be very realistic uh, for them in an actual event. So I'm gonna skip on to, we can just go on to the, the next slide. The next slide's my last one. Yeah, and so so this this is the the final slide and summarizes the the, the main takeaways. I, I won't read these verbatim, but you know my hope is that you'll you'll see from all of this that uh, that effective communication and critical messaging uh, it's not an accident. It's the result of a sustained and focused efforts that you know apply the science of risk and crisis communication to uh, to identify training gaps and, and establish best practices. Uh, you know we've seen from uh, from countless disasters and emergencies, including several recent wildfires that. Uh, that, that collectively we have to do a better job communicating with the public 
and coordinating our messages. And it's really, I think, at the core of you know, kind of who we are and what we do as emergency management and, uh, and public safety professionals. So I think the last slide is just kind of a kind of a questions, and I do look forward to answering any questions when we get to the Q and A session or at any point in the future. So thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Really great seeing what you guys are doing with exercises. We we appreciate you sharing that. Um, now we're going to hear from the Oak Ridge team, and I'm going to turn this over to Aaron Myers to talk about Eagle One. Aaron, thank you. Um... We're actually going to talk about Eagle Eye, um, the environment for now, the geolocated information on geolocated information. Um, so Eagle Eye is uh, the U.S. Department of Energy's operational situational awareness tool for the en energy sector. Uh, is sponsored by the Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response. So Eagle Eye collects utility customer outage data from uh, over 430 utilities across the U.S. We cover about 144 million customers, which is about 92% of the United States and its territories. That data is collected every 15th minute, um, so at 0, 15, 30, and 45 of each hour. Uh, and then it's, it's aggregated into common county level, state level, um, summaries of, of current electrical outages. We also break it down by utility and provide up to 30 days worth of, worth of historic data. Though we do have historic data going back all the way to 2014 uh, that is that we can uh, actively uh, engage with. Uh, this application uh, supports multiple agencies across the federal government, the Department of Energy, Homeland Security, uh, FEMA and USDA, along with their state and emergency response partners, and primarily is to support the ESF 12 energy response function out function uh, within the national response framework. And really, our goal is to provide a modern capability uh, for situational awareness uh, from emergency response and recovery. Uh, so within Eagle, I have a lot of capabilities. Um, currently really centered around electricity and that there's utility customer outages. We also include a lot of uh, current situation information, such as wildfire data. We also have, which is pulled from the National National Interagency Wildfire Center. We also have, up, we have 23 critical infrastructure layers, which were pulled from Highfeld, uh, the Homeland Infrastructure Foundation level data sets, uh, which are, uh, uh, distributed from uh, DHS, which are also updated annually. So those include transmission lines, power plants, natural gas pipeline, natural gas terminals, um, a lot of other information. And for situational awareness, we have information about earth earthquakes, uh, hurricanes, and tropical cyclones, also river observation and current washes and warnings. Um, some recent additions to Eagle Eye that too, we've added to enhance situational awareness. Um, it has been pulling in some social media data um, from PlanetSense, uh, which is a capability at Oak Ridge that you'll hear about uh, hear about in just a couple of presentations. Uh, where basically we're curating um, Twitter and Facebook information uh, that are being published by each of the utilities that we're collecting data from uh, to pro help provide that additional context. When there's an outage and there's not necessarily a big storm or a big event happening, a lot of times the utility companies will will put, put out on their social media relevant information that can help the, the, the watch offices and the response communities understand what's actually happening on the ground, give information about restoration times, and a lot of other information that just helps to enhance the situational awareness. So, and a big piece of that is, is those, are those current situation uh, layers, such as wildfires and earthquakes. Um, so, currently, Eagle has been primarily up to date uh, Eagle has been primarily a, a more of a situational awareness tool, but we're working to uh, add and integrate some new analytic capabilities. And I just wanted to talk about those uh, very briefly. Um, so the first one um, is uh, is energy infrastructure damage assessment and identification. So using either both satellite based uh, imagery, <clears throat> such as the VIRS nighttime lights or UAS imagery from drones to be able to one, identify changes in um, light output. So, you know, looking over you know, the nighttime lights, if you see a, a change in the light output, you can assume that there's been some power loss in that area. 
but from drones and UAS imagery to actually identify critical infrastructure, uh, maybe small scale infrastructure, such as um, electrical utility poles and other information that could be um, assessed for causing damage or there have been damage that could be uh, causing those uh, different outages. And so trying to look at to bring that online and a real time capability to again enhance that situational awareness, enhance the insights that the response community can have into what's actually happening on the ground. Um, in relation to that, um, some things that are kind of relevant specifically to doing that sort of work in the sense of a wildfire. Um, so we have several um, basic image processing capabilities here at a lab that aren't necessarily tied specifically to Eagle Lab, but that, that could be leveraged in our work. Um, this de dehazing uh, capability where we can we can pull smoke, we can pull fog, we can pull a lot of information out of the image to get a much clearer picture of what's happening on the ground. Um, same thing with shadow mitigation and light enhancement. So we can really do a lot of post processing on the data very rapidly um, so that we can get the raw images, post process them and, and then run them through our other algorithms to identify those impacts uh, very, very quickly uh, to provide the best answers to the decision makers. Uh, finally, or a new, another new capability that we're looking that I think is relevant to kind of situational awareness on uh, as it relates to disasters and wildfires is, is a capability called Perpinet, where we're looking at cascading impacts. Um, so kind of understanding how the electrical infrastructures and, and different infra infrastructures are connected to each other. We can use this capability to do, to do both what if scenarios, so disaster preparation. Uh, and exercises, but also when an event is happening, we can provide information not about what might be impacted within that area that can kind of within that wildfire perimeter, but also kind of what those downstream impacts are. So if certain uh, substations, if certain power plants get impacted, get taken offline, what are some of the downstream infrastructure that might be outside of that uh, impacted area that we need to be paying attention to uh, that, that might be missed um, otherwise? So we can do a lot of modeling, a lot of preparedness to understand kind of what are the cascading impacts of these different events. And finally, um, another new capability that we're working on, we're calling power outage event monitoring. So we're really looking at taking real-time situational awareness information, such as wildfire information, tornadoes, earthquakes, severe thunderstorms, and looking to correlate those events with actual utility customer outages. So not just being able to say that, yes, there are outages in this area, but this percentage or this amount of these outages were caused by this other event. So again, trying to, to, to balance that, you know, there are always um, outages kind of even on blue sky days, but can we actually correlate um, percentages of those outages to to act to another event uh, as compared to maybe there's line maintenance going on or something else happening in the electrical infrastructure that's causing those issues. And so trying to come up with models and capabilities that allow us to provide a lot more uh, information, a lot more confidence to say that these outages were caused by this external event, especially for things that are non-notice events, uh, such as those wildfires, tornadoes, and earthquakes, in comparison to hurricanes, where we tend to get uh, several days worth of notice and, and ability to prepare for those different things. And that's all I have. Um, be interested to take your questions at the end. Thank you. Aaron, thank you so much for sharing Eagle Eye with us. We appreciate it. Now I'll hand it over to Jethu Kumar from Oak Ridge to discuss forewarn satellite based change recognition and tracking. Jethu, I think you've got it. There you go, it's loading up. Okay, hey, you can see my screen fine and hear me. We sure can, and we can hear All you right. too. Perfect, thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing at uh, at Oak Ridge on uh, on the 41 project, which is a satellite based change recognition and tracking system. So just just as a context, the brief you know, background on on the wildfires. Uh, it's one of the the, the, the largest uh, and the most devastating uh, disturbance events of uh, that uh, that we have in the in the in the country. And I wanted to make a note that the wildfire management is done by a lot of different agencies. Um, so on federal lands, the USDA Forest Service, uh, Department of Interiors, and so on, and, others, and the non-federal lands, there are a lot of state agencies. 
uh, a number of agencies and entities actually monitor and record, record, record historical as well as active wildfire information. But it's important to note that they all do it differently depending on the purposes that they have. So the synoptic wall to wall examination of wildfire still tends to be missing. So for the animation that you see in the background is from the USGS monitoring trends in the burn severity, which is a, a, a most complete record of all of uh, wildfires, but uh, they only record, record wildfires that are greater than 500 uh, acres in the Eastern United States and the greater than 1000 acres in Western United. So just to give you an, just an example of, the, of, of how things are just done differently. And depending on where you are, it actually may matter. Uh, so four one provides a near real time tracking of vegetation changes across the landscapes across the entire United States. So it's all of the lower 48. It's a, it's a program that's led uh, and supported by USDA Forest Service and it's a system that's used operationally within the agency. ORL is a contributor power partner and we uh, provide a lot of uh, out of support for development of remote sensing and data analytics algorithms and technologies, high performance computing, tools and software. Uh, Warren uh, is based on MODIS NDVI, which is MODIS and Normalized Different Vegetation Index. It uses data from NASA's two of the instruments on the MODIS instruments on Aqua and Terra satellites. And it monitors all lands all the time for all possible changes, both for disturbance and recovery whether they are natural or anthropogenic disturbance, so all the way from wildfires, droughts, hurricanes, uh, anything, you know, insect affiliation, everything we can think of. Uh, it's all happening at the spatial resolution of 250 meter resolution and a temporal update frequency of every eight day with an eight day latency. So if you go to 4.1 uh, on that link today, you'll see uh, the, the, it's updated all the way to eight days uh, ago. And, uh, and it's constantly getting updated. Every eight days, there, there are updates happening. And it's designed for enhanced sensitivity, not just to look at you know, broad, very you know, abrupt changes like wildfires, but also for, for minor disturbances uh, because of frost events and insect damages and so on. So it provides a lot of different baselines to be able to detect uh, different ecosystem disturbances uh, of, of interest. So for one, because it's, uh, uh, has has a primary focus on forest lands, and this is a, sna a snapshot of one of the current you know, departure maps uh, that I grabbed a couple of days ago. Uh, but it's uh, all the calculations that it's doing is for every possible pixels on the land that you can think of. And uh, re our recent work we have expanded it to trying to cover all of North America. So this is uh, this is just a snapshot of what the current disturbance map, current departure map from uh, from uh, from four one. Uh, so it provides a fast turnaround assessment of disturbance of all vegetation and fuel and for wildfire purposes of fuel regrowth patterns. Uh, forest change assessment viewer is designed to see fine distinctions uh, of all and severe negative departures all across the corners. But uh, for wildfire fire purposes, you can start to, to tweak it uh, to be able to, to focus particularly on the wildfire disturbance uh, as opposed to uh, all possible disturbances. And it's one of the only systems that monitors departure from an expected normal condition. So in 401, you can have an expected normal uh, based on a year long baseline or a five year long baseline or a 10 year long baseline. So there, is a, there are a number of different ways uh, 401 provides information that are applicable to, uh, to different types of different events. And uh, 401 has been operational since 2010, but the data record goes all back all the way to 2000. And in 10 years that we have been uh, working with 4.1 in an operational capacity, especially for, for the purposes of wildfire disturbance, you know, it's important to know that we have noticed that the shallow root vegetation gases and shrubs respond to dry conditions rapidly and they revert and, and recover uh, quickly as well, you know, because of drugs. So when we think of wildfires, we think that uh, if you are worried about wildfires that are going to impact your, your, your forest uh, ecosystems, you really have to watch out for all the grasslands and, 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 and shrubs around you because those light fuels are susceptible to ignitions. They tend to actually show uh, the signs of the disturbance uh, fairly early. And with a near real-time real capability, you can start to monitor those changes uh, really well. This is an example uh, that I identified in the middle of the screen on this animation is 
the campfire in the Butte County, California, which was which is one of the fires that was uh, ignited by a faulty uh, electrical transmission line. And you can start to see how for one track that 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 wildfire event over time. And uh, my animation goes all the way, uh, you know, for to a year after the fire, and you can see you know, on plot that's on the on the bottom right corner that uh, that the system has not recovered from uh, from that that fairly abrupt. Uh, disturbance uh, since the wildfire, but uh, it, it illustrates the capability of, uh, of what we can do with eight day tracking. Uh, all of the 4.1 data products are free uh, uh, on a view, uh, viewer that's at 4.1.forestforest.org. Uh, there are no login or password required and all near real time as well as historical data products since 2000 are readily accessible through uh, WMS and WCS services. And uh, for one is doing every possible uh, disturbance. What I wanted to do is just, you know, uh, take a minute to, to, to talk about what is that's most relevant for electrical infrastructure. We really want to be focused on, on the wildfire disturbances, and we would like to be able to know what's happening before wildfire, so that you know, a potential risk, so uh, before fire happened, where it might happen, and then during wildfires, how it's actually from moving, where it may move uh, for uh, for different purposes for readiness and planning and response. So, in order to zoom into areas of interest, right now, 41 is doing a 250 meter resolution, but there's uh, there are other data sources that can be brought in to be start to improve this test, both the spatial resolution as well as temporal uh, frequency of these updates to a to a lot uh, lot frequent um, manner that that may be more relevant for uh, uh, for electrical infrastructure. And then uh, the idea of risk. So wildfire requires these things to happen. You have to have the fuels available. You have to have conditions uh, right for wildfire to happen. And then you just need an ignition source. Things the number one and number two is something that we can do ahead of time before the wildfire has happened. So there is a way to start to, to look at all these data sets that we have available to us and, and start to, uh, to identify these potential risks and that can actually uh, inform uh, the mitigation and, and, uh, and planning. And then the last point of a, a wildfire spread. So wildfire can start at a, at a new infrastructure and can spread out, or it can have be a ha it can happen the other way. Where wildfire somewhat uh, that was started elsewhere may actually read a power line infrastructure by doing a good assessment of where the fuels are, uh, what how those things are con are connected, and what will happen. So we can start to drive these what if scenarios of uh, of conditions when uh, uh, when when a particular infrastructure may be vulnerable and start to use those in, uh, in our monitoring and uh, mitigation processes. Uh, so uh, that's all I have, and I'll be happy to take questions later on in, uh, in the discussion session. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Um, as a reminder, please keep submitting your questions in the chat box. Um, we are going to be holding them till the end, but we are going to be going through a number of questions. So include the name of the speaker or the topic when you submit your question. Our final speaker from Oak Ridge is Dr. Gautam Thakdur, who is going to discuss grid sense. So I'm going to hand it over. Thank you, Meredith. There you go. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Gautam Thakur. I am uh, RNA staff scientist here in Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, I work uh, in National Security and Sciences uh, Directorate here. Um, the motivation for today's talk is to kind of a little bit more unconventional in um, situational awareness situations uh, where non-authoritative data like tweets or Foursquare check-ins or Facebook uh, posts could be used towards um, improving our understanding of natural disasters, uh, improving our understanding of evacuations, and at least to kind of guide in near real time about uh, on ground situations. There are certain challenges uh, when we think about uh, these situations and how to improve uh, and how to capture this data. So there's a lot of science behind how we approach uh, this, this uh, problem of collecting, processing, uh, informing and creating a reasonable understanding of, of any situation. 
as Aaron said earlier, we did uh, as of now uh, collect information from over 100 utilities that talk about outages, that talk about restoration, and we do process that information to create a more uh, reasonable second line of evidence uh, that supports um, any measured outage information that's coming out of utilities. And in situations when it is not possible, like any natural disasters, when utilities tend to be more rely on sharing the outage information or any kind of information uh, through social media, I guess, Platforms like GridSense would um, would come pretty handy in in creating information that you can reliably then send it to first responders or even for policy guidance. So the the, the narrative here is to kind of how we can incorporate citizen science uh, in more serious uh, understanding of modeling as well as predicting impacts to energy infrastructure. So I borrow uh, one of the motivations, this work that we did in the past during the Smokies wildfire here in Gatlinburg, which are pretty close to our home here. Uh, in 2016, uh, on the left side, you see there's a, there's a wildfire tweet that Great Smoky Mountain uh, National Forest Services handle tweeted about a 0.25 acre wildfires. They sent a picture, they sent the location of that. They also said that what's the estimate, uh, they, they think that this area is closed, but then they hope that it would open. Fast forward by the time of November 2019, there were a couple of wildfires that happened and a large part of National, uh, National Park uh, was officially closed and severe damages were happened to infrastructure, uh, to human life, but also um, a lot of uh, animals and natural uh, scenic beauty of, of National Park was compromised. And uh, it was surprising to see that this was the first information that came out from uh, from National Park Services and that was actually tweeted uh, around that time frame on November 14th. And the actual wildfire that, that really got out of control was happened on November 23rd of, of 2016. So um, as we look into uh, this thing that was kind of a real historic tragedy for for the state of Tennessee. Over 14 people were killed at that time, over 190 people were injured, and over 90 percent of the entire Gatlinburg area, as well as the Smoky Mountain National Park, was evacuated uh, at that time. Uh, over two billion dollar worth of losses were happened, and over 2,500 uh, critical infrastructure, including electric grid, power transmission lines, but also like hospitals, schools, hotels, uh, cabins were destroyed around that time. Uh, the actual duration of this was November 14 to November 20 through December 22nd, but the actual fires were pretty much ended in on November 29th. Uh, to early first week of December, but after that it was mostly uh, rescue and uh, post disaster recovery plans. And with a matter of few days to a week, uh, over 28 square miles of, uh, of area were burned down at that time. So uh, <clears throat> there is kind of this is kind of a timeline that I, I created based on a report uh, generated and also based on some of the data collection that time. So as I said, like 14th number was the first day when the first chimney top uh, fire was detected by the National Park Service, followed by a much bigger fire that was detected on 23rd. And uh, from 23rd to 28th, uh, the fire was continued to rise and there was some heroic uh, plans uh, were in play to detect and extinguish these fires, but at the same time, uh, a lot of information through citizen science uh, platforms like social medias and, um, <clears throat> and Facebook and Twitter were being shared by people. They were sharing their location, they were sharing uh, how intense these fires were, they were sharing ground photos as well at the same time, and we're sharing lat long coordinates where exactly their location is. So uh, if you see that 23rd to 28th was the actual time frame when we had enough time and enough capacity. Of course, the terrain was complex, but what I wanted to show here is there was a real opportunity to, to identify and make uh, plans and activate those plans uh, during that time. 
And by the 28th, uh, city of Gatlinburg uh, in the evening, early, early evenings, uh, city of Gatlinburg started to experience intermittent power outage. And um, that suddenly spiraled into Gatlinburg being completely losing the power to Tennessee Valley Authority, losing their transmission lines uh, within a matter of hours. Of course, that was restored uh, soon after. But uh, the matter of the fact is there was an interdependence of a lot of different networks uh, like electrical cell, everything was lost within that time frame. And these kind of things could be avoided if we, besides us having information from sensors about satellite, we can also try to understand uh, and capture information that people are sharing uh, through these unconventional data sources like Twitter. And this is like some tens of tweets that we collected that time out of several thousand tweets that were shared by people. And as you can see here, uh, people were actually sharing the location, they're sharing the time of the day, and also like what's the situation on ground. And uh, in order to kind of really capture all this information, there was a need for us to. Um, so these are the two counties that were affected, or 11,000 customers were uh, short of electricity and they were waiting for some kind of restoration, but also evacuation was done in order for saving more lives. But when you look uh, beyond just kind of looking at a small problem, it was important to also look at from a very scientific challenge and from research challenges as well. When we think about collecting this data and really sharing this information in near real time for policy making and the guidance, there, there, there's a there's a need to create a more sustainable data intensive computing system. So uh, Aaron and me and a lot of other people here at the lab we spent an enormous amount of time in a couple of years trying to fine tune how we can collect these data sets, how we can process them in near real time, how to detect outliers because most of this data is volunteer data, non authoritative data. So how we can trust this data that if a person is talking about wildfires, there is indeed a wildfire. So this platform basically captures information from different sources like uh, sensors, but also captures data from social media data. We have over 25 to 30 virtual machines where their job is just to look for unconventional data sources and look for uh, data that might have some kind of like a national disaster, like wildfires, outages, restorations, uh, flooding, and things like that. And then we have built um, a stack of different machine learning models that process this data in near real time. But at the same time, we also added a human in loop component to really pinpoint information that uh, that before it gets onto any system would say yes and no. Like this information is real, this information may be doubtful. So we basically create some kind of layer of confidence in this data as well. And finally, that data can be then shared with any third party. So the right part of this restful services and good sense users and eagle eyes where we can create a restful uh, and kind of soap uh, or paths kind of infrastructure that can connect with any third party platform. So, uh, so there's a lot of science and scientific uh, need to kind of capture and process this information to make it a real stable and reliable system. But at the end of the day, it's really a combination of very different kind of data sources like ground photos, for example, or GPS data or social media data or people talking from uh, different sensors to sharing that information and and then uh, we, we built basically a lot of systems surrounding this crowdsourcing approach to improve our understanding it's where the ontologies of different data set has to be mapped with ontology of what we talk when we talk about outages in in tnd for example and how we can operationalize it it's kind of where you can kind of really make that a more uh, trusted platform. So this is kind of an active ongoing research at this time. And with Eagle Eye team, we're trying to kind of um, at least scope our current work to outages, restoration, and some of the other related information that can uh, complement more authoritative data at this time. So this is just kind of a rundown of how we basically approach this problem, capability, and the ability of this work look like. Uh, beyond uh, in the Smokies, we have also explored to use this approach uh, during Puerto Rican outages a couple of years back. DT outages that were happened uh, a couple of years back where uh, where the uh, utility started to share this information through social media data rather than updating their own websites. So having this second line of evidence would definitely kind of create a more compelling evidence to, to use and consider this kind of work in mainstream outage analysis as well. 
So uh, here kind of uh, I opened the floor for any questions, anything I could answer at this time. And thank you. Got it. Thank you so much. Appreciate all of that. Um, please continue to submit your questions. We've got a growing list and we are looking forward to getting to those at the end. So now we're going to explore situational awareness capabilities from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. David Judy is going to discuss Water Extreme Lookup Library. So David, I will be driving your slides for you. So just let me know when you're ready to move to the next one. And you might need to unmute David. Yeah, I'm, I'm on my phone, so hopefully that works. Can you hear me? There we go. We can we can hear you. I'm muting two spots. Sorry about that. Um, so this this talk may be a little different as it isn't directly power grid related and uh, to date hasn't been applied to wildfire. But we see some possibilities on how that those connections can be made. So uh, next slide. Uh, first, a little background to set some context for the Water Extreme Lookup Library. One of our objectives at PNNL is to develop and apply state-of-the-art infrastructure analytics that can really support the needs of a broad infrastructure protection mission. Uh, the analytics uh, in general are used to characterize things like infrastructure fragility and resilience, uh, the dependencies on natural systems or the, even the coexistence within natural systems interdependencies between infrastructure systems and the uh, potentially the evaluation of the service infrastructure provides to support communities and the economy. So in particular, we're, we're interested in understanding uh, both endogenous and exogenous disturbances to in infrastructure systems. So as you all may be aware, weather extremes are the most frequent significant causes of widespread infrastructure disruption, and that's kind of what we've heard today. So with that in mind, we've developed a number of capabilities to characterize hazards such that this information can be used uh, to understand cascading effects uh, within infrastructure systems. Uh, these are intended to be applicable to planning, response, recovery, uh, all those activities uh, from an extreme event. Uh, next slide. One of the areas we've spent a great uh, deal of time thinking about is enhancing situational awareness during extreme events and specifically within the context of floods. Now, I know the topic today is wildfire, uh, but hopefully you'll see some connections uh, in this talk and how it may be extended to help within a wildfire response. And I'll uh, point out a couple of things here. Uh, the situational awareness capabilities are really driven by uh, the infrastructure mission, including interactions with the emergency operations centers and the questions that they're asking, which in the case of floods has been, what is the spatial extent of flooding? When will the flood arrive? How long will the flood remain? Um, and some of the more pressing questions about how many people are at risk and what infrastructure assets are at risk. So how do we support in the case of flood events, how do we support these uh, questions? We have three primary approaches. Um, from a real-time or near real-time real sense, we, we use predictive modeling and simulation, uh, which I'll give a talk about in a, a couple of weeks on uh, relative to post-fire recovery. Uh, we use imagery-based damage analytics. Um, my colleague, Andre Coleman, uh, will talk on that in the context of fire. Um, and then the topic today, which is access and leverage previously simulated events stored in an archive, which is the Water Extreme Lookup Library, to rapidly enhance situational awareness. As we like to say, if you need data, go to the well. Uh, slide, next slide. So what is the well? As I mentioned, the well is a readily accessible archive of flood simulations. There were a number of requirements that drove to de uh, the development of the well, and I'll just briefly mention a couple of those things. Uh, broadly accessible to a wide range of people, so it had to be cloud enabled. Uh, provide geospatial visual visualization, um, but also make the data and the meta information or metadata available and ingestible uh, within other environments through uh, APIs, for example. Um, and it needed to be searchable uh, efficiently, both through spatial and text-based queries. So we believe there are many benefits to having a large repository of hazard data. It can assist in plan studies. Um, with a large set of hazard data, there are opportunities for unique data analytics, which include risk and resilience analyses. Uh, it can be used to rapidly enhance situational awareness from the pending event uh, by finding existing hazards that may have similar uh, characteristics. And it uh, also may become an initiating point for new simulations that you may want to run. 
to have an archive that can do these things, you have to be able to fill the well with data. And the key to that is automation and simulations. Next slide. Thank you. I'm not going to go into the details of the well implementation. I'll show you a graphic here. Other than to tell you the well is implemented within the Azure Cloud environment, simulations uh, that generate hazard data, in this case we're talking about floods, can occur, uh, occur either within the cloud environment or outside, but they're ingested and stored within the well. Uh, the well contains uh, indexing and OGC compliant services to, to search, uh, visualize, and make the data accessible to users. Next slide. I, I mentioned the key to filling the well is automation. So we've worked to automate a number of, uh, in this case, flood hazard types, which we can develop and store thousands of scenarios. Uh, we've automated uh, continental scale wide dam failure simulations, utilizing the available uh, national inventory of dams and characteristics of dams available in that data set to de develop flood extents for thousands of potential events. We've automated processes to develop riverine flood extents using national hydrography data sets and observational data available from locations like the USGS. Uh, we've also been automating processes to develop urban area extreme event uh, flooding, so which consists of urban area footprints and uh, precipitation curves like you might uh, get from NOAA, uh, NOAA data sets. We're also working towards more automation in active areas coastal focused where we're automating hurricanes and compound flooding. And of rele uh, relevance to today's topic, we have high interest in written a number of concepts on developing automated simulations to store post-fire extreme runoff scenarios uh, to provide in additional insight uh, into regions that may be more prone to longer-term indirect impact from wildfire conditions. Next slide. So over the next few slides, I'll show some screenshots of the well. The first screenshot is uh, the access page for the well. You'll note that it says open well, and I'll talk about what that means uh, towards the end of this, um, some of the recent work we're doing. Another option we have within this is, that I'll point out is that we have provided analysts who have access to this with the limited ability to develop their own simulations so they can run new simulations that can be stored in the well. Uh, in this case, it, it, it's limited, but it requires little expertise for an analyst uh, to be able to execute against it. Next slide. Uh, this is a screenshot of what you actually see when you go into the well environment. The heat map is an indicator of locations where simulations have been completed and exist, and the colors, different colors indicate types of simulations that are available, uh, representing the hazard, hazard data. Users can search geographically by using standard mouse actions and select uh, a simulation of geographic or type of uh, interest. Uh, users can also use a text on the left to find simulations that they might be looking for based on keywords. Next slide. When a user does select a simulation that is of interest to them to enhance their situation awareness, the data from the event is loaded into a map-based viewer as seen here. Uh, the data is interactive, meaning the user can interrogate the data to find parameters that they may be interested in. For example, what is the flood depth at this location and other parameters such as uh, timing of, of floods. Each simulation contains uh, metadata about the parameters that went into the simulation, when the simulation run, was run, with what code, et cetera. All the data is also downloadable and adjustable into other workflows, which is an important uh, requirement as we work with partners, uh, such as state uh, emergency operation centers and uh, FEMA partners, that they can pull this information into their workflows to do the types of analytics that they're responsible for. Uh, next slide. So how has the well been used? Well, in, in general, it's been used to provide rapid insight to potential flood threats. Um, an example of that was during Hurricane Maria uh, in potential dam failures in Puerto Rico. Uh, just as an example, there were media releases, um, even from the National Weather Service, tweeting out indicating thousands could die from a potential failure, dam failure, 70,000 people at risk. The well was able to immediately inform our partners um, and, and about the potential consequences, which was significantly lower than what was being published, which helped inform their response strategy over the next few hours. Another application which is pretty exciting is using the information in the well, the hazard information, to facilitate infrastructure protection training and tabletop exercises. So training whether it be responders or other analysts on how they might respond to different types of events. Next slide. 
So I, uh, previous slide mentioned open well and just a little bit more about what that means as this is a large part of our current activities with regards to the well. The well was initially developed to support the federal infrastructure protection mission, but the applicability of the well goes beyond just that mission. Well, the, the well and the information in the well applies to state, local emergency planners and responders. We've had a lot of interactions over time and discussions with them. Uh, to that end, we've been expanding the vision of the well, which has included looking at identifying cost-effective approaches for broad, broader cloud-based scaling, including uh, hazard types beyond just floods. Um, Third-party simulated data being able to be ingested into the well, not just data that we may generate, but out in the community, really to embrace community-based ensembles or a multi-model approach to the types of hazards we're looking at so that we can start looking at characterizing uncertainty in, um, for models or modeler uh, decisions. And finally, we think the well architecture expandable, as I've mentioned, expandable beyond flood data, include other types of extreme event data, uh, useful in infrastructure analysis, including wildfire. Next slide. There's a fantastic team working on this um, over the last uh, couple of years, uh, and one of them, Dan Corbiani, you're going to hear from uh, next. So thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate all that information on the well. Uh, so now we're going to turn it over to Dan Corbiani to talk, who's our final speaker from PNNL. He's going to walk us through the hotspot analysis tool. So Dan, uh, the floor is yours. Cool. Well, thanks for that. And thanks, Dave, for the uh, the intro. I appreciate you finding that picture from back in the day. I don't even know where you found it. So uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to present today. I appreciate it. I think this is this is a great opportunity to see all the other programs that the labs are doing. I think that this presentation may also be a little different. Uh, we have done this for a more broad set of, of impacts, So, but I think that this will still be applicable for wildfire. So as I said, I'm Dan Corbiani. I'm a data scientist at PNNL. So there we go. So in terms of an agenda, the thing I'll start out with is what is the hotspot analysis tool? What are we doing here? Uh, then I'll get right into some results. I find that maps are usually good for communicating what we've done. So I'll go right there. Then if there's time, I'll touch a little bit on the challenges and the technical approach we took. And then for those that have GIS knowledge, I'll talk a little bit potentially about the implemented algorithms. So what is the hotspot analysis tool? Uh, we also call this the proximity tool sometimes, depending on the context. And I think to, to start with, uh, it's important to understand where this came from. So our goal was to really find spatially concentrated industries that were a high risk of disruption from hazards. Those hazards could be a lot of things. They could be hurricanes and flooding, like Dave was talking about, or they could be wildfires or man-made risks, any, anything along those lines. We had a couple interesting requirements that made this a little different. Uh, the first is that we wanted our tool, well, we needed the tool to be able to be deployed in multiple environments. Those could be things that are connected to the internet, like other national labs or more secure environments that don't have access to the internet. Uh, we were specifically asked not to create a framework, a UI, a platform, anything like that. Um, this was a tool that should work behind the scenes and be integrated into other places. So that's my, uh, kind of disclaimer of any maps in here are, are uh, development maps and used for just illustrating points. Uh, this gets integrated into other systems with much fancier uh, visuals. And then the last thing that requirement that we had was we really wanted to be able to simplify the deployment and validation of research code. We found that the, uh, the feedback loop between some of our sponsors requesting an algorithm and then testing that algorithm on data and then hardening that algorithm with tests and documentation and then deploying it to them that that process can sometimes take a long time. So we wanted to make that simpler and easier and get everybody working together on the same same page. So the elephant in the room that I always feel I need to mention is can't we just use a heat map for proximity? I mean, that looks great in most cases. And, and that does work in a lot of cases, but not all cases because heat maps work on showing the concentration based on global information. So if we look to the right here, there's a heat map of total beds and you might see some cells there that that are hotter around New York City and maybe in Chicago. But if you're looking at something that has more spatial concentration to it, it's not as interesting to know that New York is uh, it has more beds when you're in Chicago. That's not, not useful for you. So one of the, the algorithms really does take that spatial concentration into consideration, and you'll see more clusters forming in smaller areas like Columbus or Indianapolis or Detroit. 
So before I flip the slide and go into some results, uh, what I'm going to be talking about here are uh, two visualization sets that we created to help communicate our results and validate the algorithms. One is a dashboard that we used to help uh, to, to do that at the national scale, and another one is more uh, regional and we used uh, block level data. Again, not a UI team, so please uh, keep that in mind as you see the visuals. So this is the dashboard that we used to look at the national level uh, concentrations and clustering around different uh, different industries. For this data, we used the county business patterns data, which has high resolution sector information, but it's at the county level. And this was really interesting because there are thousands of sectors that are represented in the county business patterns data. Um, but again, it's not very granular. So what we have here is on the top left, we have a cluster ranking map, and this is just our ensemble algorithms results of uh, how probable we think an area is to be part of a cluster. And then on the bottom left, we, we weight that ranking. Um, we found that there were certain cases where just a, a pure spatial uh, clustering didn't work. Uh, a good example of this might be mining, where you have a, a mine that's off in the middle of nowhere, but it happens to produce a ton of iron ore we needed a way to be able to wait based on an attribute. And we threw this map in there to, to understand when we might need to do that. The one on the upper right, uh, that's an employee concentration map. That's kind of like a heat map. That's where the analysts normally start. They take an attribute, they make a heat map. This is what they see. And it was important for us to validate that our algorithm was different or was not. Um, if, if the attribute and the heat map worked, then maybe that's great. But we wanted to be able to show those side by side to be able to validate the algorithm. We also provided a couple filters for people so we could kind of understand where um, where different values should be set for each of these sectors and make sure that we were consistent. So I will now remove the, the slight fog. And uh, this one is for textile mills. I like this one because it's very much not sensitive, but it's very interesting in my opinion. When you look at employee concentration, you see a lot of employees in the LA area. But when you run it through the ensemble clustering, it ends up highlighting an area around South Carolina, North Carolina, and then in the Boston area. What we did with this is we, we ran through all of the sectors in the county business patterns. We've then found the sectors that were highly spatially concentrated. And then we started to validate, is this right? Is this algorithm producing the right thing? And in this case, there are some really interesting historical contexts on why Boston and that North Carolina region are, are what they are. So the next one that I, I like to show is some block level data. So for this, we use the uh, census workforce area characteristics data. This, uh, this we were looking at accommodation and food service in Las Vegas. We ran this analysis across the entire US, across all the block levels. We used a couple thousand machines to, to run this, which is part of the, the reason that we, we have done so much architecture work to make that simpler. But we looked at accommodation and food service in Las Vegas because there's a lot of, of that in Vegas. And we really wanted to know, was the algorithm able to pick up anything interesting in an area like that? And what we can see on the bottom left is, you know, the accommodation and food service sector is strong in Las Vegas. But on the top right, you see the, the result from the ensembling algorithm says, this is the Las Vegas strip without any knowledge that, of anything else besides the number of employees in each of these blocks. So that was pretty exciting to us. And that kind of helped validate uh, our entire process. So just really quickly, why is this hard? Why are we talking about this? Why is this a national lab problem? Uh, first off, geospatial data sets are available in lots of formats and for projections. Uh, I think we've seen that through multiple presentations today. Bang was talking about it. There have been a couple other people that have mentioned having ETL pieces. Uh, the other part is that the data sets are fragmented across a lot of different services. So you might have something on data.gov. You might have something in Eagle Eye. You may have something um, hosted by a local municipality. So that makes it really hard when you want to aggregate all of that data together, and especially if you want this platform to be able to be transformed uh, or transitioned into different environments. So there are other some other specific library challenges that we've had in terms of algorithms and documentations. Um, but the, the main problem that we've had is that very few algorithms have been designed from scaling for scaling in the, in, uh, from scratch. So what we found is that there are really a couple primary ways that algorithms have been produced. One is let's run that, let's download the data locally onto a single machine. Let's run some Python or Java and come up with an output. And then I'm going to give the output to somebody or I'll make a map. And that works great for some things. Another architecture we see a lot is the uh, the big server architecture, I call it, 
where you have one database to rule them all and you have a couple servers that are around it and you do all your analysis in that space, all the data is available for you, works really well for some cases and that's also great. But what we were trying to get at was something where we could use a, a more modern approach where we could use low cost storage and on demand compute to, uh, to solve these challenges. And by doing that, that allows us to transition basically the, the library to other environments, but not necessarily have to move the data. And really quickly, what that entails is uh, we, we have these building blocks. So we have some user focused APIs. These APIs are the ones that would get integrated into um, our sponsors workflows. So we have data sets and these data sets contain all the ETL process to get external data converted into something very usable. Uh, and that's kind of where they stop. It just manages the ETL piece. Uh, we have the algorithms. So we have a lot of pattern of life information in here. We have a lot of clustering algorithms, things of that nature. Then we have workflows that we use to, to manage an entire uh, algorithm process. So let me get some data, let me run a bunch of algorithms on it, do some ensembling, produce an output. So we capture these workflows in, in single blocks that then people can use in their environments. And then lastly, we have uh, some visualization and output pieces because ultimately we do need to visualize things because if you don't visualize on a map, a table doesn't get the point across. Uh, and we also make it easy to put this into like different databases and such. I'm not going to talk through the rest of these uh, in any detail. So I think that I'm probably pretty close to out of time, but I, I will touch on this slide really quickly. Um, one of the things that also makes spatial proximity analysis hard is how do you define near? Um, and especially in a lot of our things, we're talking about administrative boundaries or hazard boundaries. And those can have vastly different sizes and shapes. So one of the issues is that an administrative boundary specifically, you know, you can have something in Manhattan versus Alaska. And how do you how do you figure out what's near each other? Do you use a constant distance? Do you use something like these are the neighboring polygons? It, it becomes a, a very nuanced question and sometimes very data specific. Additionally, the the uh, the difference in sizes on those administrative boundaries can cause a lot of visual artifacts and maps. So if Manhattan is really important but only has one pixel, it's very likely that an analyst will mix that one pixel and see something in Alaska much sooner because Alaska might have 500 pixels. So along these lines, one of the things that we've been focusing on is really converting a lot of these administrative and odd regions into uh, H3 hexagons. These are developed by Uber. Uh, they work really well for most of the analysis that we've been doing and they make it, they give us something that has a near constant size, which makes uh, density a lot easier to calculate. They have a near constant distance between each other and specifically they have a, a pretty constant number of neighbors and that makes it very easy for us to start rolling things up. They also are uniquely indexed by a, a string. So that makes it easy for us to join data sets, transition them to other places um, and store them. So I think I'm going to stop there. I do have a couple other slides that will be part of the, the print piece. So thank you. I, I'm here because of a, a great team. Uh, also, just a, a quick plug. We do host a big geospatial data meetup. Uh, we have a bunch of very passionate people on there the first Thursday of the month. So if you're, if you're interested in uh, big geospatial data, shoot me an email and uh, we can send you an invite. Thank you so much, Stan. We appreciate all that information. So we have our final presentation of the day is from Dr. Ken Armijo from Sandia National Laboratories. He's going to discuss high low power R&D arc and ground fault detection mitigation. So Ken, I'm going to turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I am going to share my screen if that's OK with you all. OK, um, so thank you for that introduction. I'm going to be talking about our high and low power research and development arc and ground fault uh, capabilities that we have at Sandia. Um, uh, my background, I originally I, at one time I was a volunteer firefighter and I remember electrical fires tended to be some of the most hazardous and challenging types of fires to address. Um, in my present job as a systems engineer and uh, scientist, I study a lot of arc and ground faults with my colleagues at Sandia for both DC and AC systems. For this presentation, I'm going to talk about photovoltaic or PV and direct current DC systems that have been linked to dozens of fires around the world. 
Um, as we can see here on this map on the right, uh, there's a number of uh, in PV DC installations that are have been going up, especially at large scale near forested areas. So this research that we do has a direct relevance for power transmission scale wiring and forest fire potential, as well as for future distributed PV near forested areas. For arc faults, fundamentally, uh, arc faults occur when there is a voltage uh, breakdown between two, a break in two current carrying conductors, whereby you have an arc discharge that can eject shrapnel as well as high temperature molten metal that can uh, reach temperatures as high as 20,000 degrees C uh, that can cause secondary fires. And what we're finding uh, is that many uh, new PV installations are getting to 1000 volt and 1500 volt uh, scales based on this uh, research that you can see here on the left, um, which increases the propensity for potential arc fires because you have higher ohmic heating, you have the uh, potential higher corrosion potential that you can have in your wires and a variety of other reliability challenges. Um, not to mention that it's not just the arc fault that is of consequence, but you can also have electromagnetic interference, uh, EMI type issues, as well as other pressure waves based uh, such as the plot that we show here on the top right. Uh, these fire, there's been a lot of notable fires, such as the Bakersfield fire and PV back in 2009, and also in AC fires, uh, such as the San Onofre uh, nuclear generation fire, uh, station fire in 2001. Generally with AC fire, uh, with AC arc faults, uh, once you pass the, the zero point crossing, usually for low voltage arc faults, that's enough to snuff out the fire, but we're seeing that at high voltage, it's not enough, and you can have very large discharges that can occur. So the capabilities that we have at Sandia National Labs, such as our patented arc generation system, uh, has allowed us to fundamentally assess the physics uh, physics of failure that facilitates these arc fault events. We're able to leverage um, DC power supplies and DC simulators and PV simulators, as well as AC simulators, in addition to actual photovoltaic arrays that we can route into our distributed energy technologies lab, or DETL, where we can assess uh, the physics of failure with these arc fault, um, with this arc fault generator. As you can see in these videos here, visual video, IR, as well as some information from our high-speed photography, all different types of arc faults, we're able to spectrally understand the different types of arc faults generated from different types of electrode materials, insulation materials, as well as environmental conditions, such as humidity, uh, looking at static air uh, temperatures, as well as pressure. Uh, another facility uh, that we have at Sandia National Labs uh, and capability is our Sandia Lightning Simulator Facility and our ACD facility, where we are able to actually now uh, leverage these very high capacitive discharge systems for assessing um, very high voltage arc faults up to 10,000 uh, volts. This has allowed us to very, uh, very in a very controlled manner assess these arc faults and see their progression uh, with respect to physics, fundamental physics, and then be able to leverage our models, which I'll talk about in a second, for validation. Another capability that we use at Sandia for a variety of both DOE, DOD, and other uh, capabilities and mission areas is photometrics, where we have high-speed photography for both optical photography and IR photography that can have uh, image processing between 100,000 to a million frame rates per second. So that way we can look at micro arcs uh, at the millisecond scale and even nanosecond scale to a certain extent, uh, all the way to the regular second and minute time scales. We've been able to take a lot of this capability to actual uh, facilities to, in a very controlled manner, facilitate larger arc faults in the field. Uh, for AC, uh, this is some of the application space where we've leveraged our plate calorimeters, as well as other sensors developed at Sandia National Laboratory, as you can see on this test stand, if you can see my cursor on the left, uh, where we're able to facilitate these large, massive, and impressive arc faults and assess the zone of influence and the incident energy, as well as other reliability challenges. 
In the DC space, we've been able to facilitate these fires in a controlled manner for uh, combiner boxes, inverters, and other power electronics equipment to understand the physics of failure, how it goes from a very simple arc in a box, as you see uh, in the UL 1699B codes and standards, or IEEE 1584, and apply it to actual real world conditions, such as in this 1000 volt uh, DC PV system. Uh, using our uh, high speed photometric uh, data and a lot of our in house processing capabilities, we've been able to look at examine temperatures of arc faults that can exceed 5000 degrees Kelvin and understand how the physics of failure can occur with more complicated topologies and geometries within uh, PV systems. Oops, here we go. And uh, also impressively enough, we've been able to leverage our high speed photometric information to also do particle tracking of high temperature particles in both the rotational aspects and their directional aspects to understand how the zone of influence is not just simply a circle, but it can be an evolution over time. And over time, I mean two seconds, which is the requirement per UL 6099B and IEEE 1584. Here we go. And with that, we've been able to also convolve many of our spectral um, capabilities along with IR to assess zone of influence where we can precisely understand the ignition zone and the locations where per personal protective equipment or PPE are required for electrical safety workers, as well as understanding what the uh, basically where the fires can occur, what the distribution of the fires can be locally and on a larger global scale uh, for uh, at least the initial fires. Another interesting aspect of the research we do have, and lately some of the interesting results I'm showing here is we've been looking at uh, restrike. It's not enough that we also see just arc blasts and arc flashover events, but we've actually learned for certain configurations, even after an initial arc fault occurs, you can actually get a restrike like you're seeing here in the top right, where um, the arc basically can continue for a longer period of time and you have more serious consequences for fires. And with all this fundamental research, we've been able to understand solution, the solution space for mitigating and putting out these uh, arc fault events. Uh, we've been able to develop wavelet models and other fast Fourier transform FFTs uh, models to understand the signatures that lead up to an arc fault event and leveraging arc fault circuit interrupters, understand how to more reliably and to reduce nuisance tripping, uh, snuff out these arc faults. And also in very exciting manner, uh, we've also been able to leverage, uh, start studying a new class of materials similar to self healing materials. We're developing self extinguishing materials to not only uh, to uh, basically support the active uh, uh, mitigation methods with arc fault circuit interrupters. We're able to passively put out these arc fault fires, such as you see here in the bottom right, where uh, an arc fault occurs, and this layer by layer nano composite materials developed by Sandia's lab directed research and development program have been able to snuff out these fires. Another area of self extinguishment research is the development of self extinguishing connectors that can be used beyond both of these self extinguishing methods used beyond photovoltaics for both PV oh, sorry for DC wiring and AC wiring in order to self extinguish uh, arc faults. Here we're looking for application spaces in the electric larger electric grid, as well as in automotive and aerospace applications where you can have miles and miles, it seems like of wiring. And so these arc faults have been able to be extinguished within two seconds, as you can see here on the bottom right. Um, and in order to really fundamentally understand the physics of failure and the causes of these arcs, we've been lever able to leverage Sandia National Lab Sierra Code Suite, uh, such as the ARIA program, in order to understand these thermal distributions, understand enthalpy a little bit better and how that occurs within the spark gap region between two electric uh, current carrying conductors. In the ground fault research, uh, where ground faults occur when you have an uh, exposed unintentional non current carrying conducting metals uh, part where it wasn't intentionally you wanted current to occur, but uh, you effectively end up with these blind spots that can uh, facilitate fires. And we've done a lot of research on fuse based ground fault detectors and eruptors, GFDIs, 
where we found vulnerability and nuisance uh, trip issues with these types of devices. And in so doing, we've been able to do some research on these advanced GFDIs, as well as leveraging SPICE simulations in-house and field measurements to determine uh, leakage current and threshold limits for residual current detectors, or RCDs, as well as isolation-resistant checkers and current sense relays, or CSRs. A lot of this research we've been able to publish, especially with respect to current leakage, which has been a problem for ground fault uh, uh, situations. Um, I am sure uh, this is my last slide here. I wanted to just point out a few key Sandia Arc and Ground Fault colleagues that have been working with me. And if you all are interested, I have my email on the top. Uh, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you very much. And thank you so much. And thank you to all of our panelists. This was great information and so good to hear all the things that you guys are doing. We have 15 minutes left uh, in today's webinar, so we want to try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, so we are going to shift over to that. Um, so panelists, uh, when I do ask you a question, if we if you can be as succinct as possible, that would be great, and we'll be able to get to as many as we can. So uh, Fang, this first question is for you. It's actually two questions. Number one, um, is the combined fire and incident report available? And two, what factors are driving fire risk index? Uh, all right, yeah, uh, I think I already typed the answer there, but just be briefly. Uh, so there are many uh, factors that driving this uh, fire index, for example, the weather, uh, precipitation, daily maximal uh, temperature, humidity, and also the fuel uh, load. Uh, sorry, what's the first question? Will that be available? Yeah, yeah, um, the is the, yeah, the fire incident report yeah. available? Yeah, they will be available. You know, it's just a, a large uh, Excel file. So if you want, we can share with you. Yeah, thanks. Very good, thank you. Brett, the next question is for you. Um, how are city energy offices, ESF 12, managing and coordinating with utilities that have PSPS policies and when they are implemented and coordinating downstream impacts that impact life safety issues. And I think you're still on mute, Brett. Okay, I'm gonna come back to you, Brett. Uh, let's see, um, Aaron, does Urban Net also simulate cascading impacts of dynamic events such as arc faults caused by wildfire wildfires in the power grid? It can. Um, we just need to know the location and what infrastructure is impacted, and then we can kind of run the simulation from there. Uh, it's currently not completely automated to, to run, you know, that quickly. It requires user input, but that's something we're working towards is to be able to dynamically generate that sort of output based on different information. Very good, thank you. And Brett, I think you are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after a year of the pandemic, I think we all would have figured out the mute button, but it's still a uh, work in progress. Uh, yeah, so I did, I did hear the question. I think a gr great question. And I think there is really an absolute need for you know the, the various local, state, federal agencies, and private industry and utilities to, to come together and have those kinds of conversations and, and do that planning. You know, I, I'm not positive on a kind of a state to state basis. Um, how that's being done, but I do think that states are really in a unique position to kind of to kind of drive that. And this really is all part of that idea that I mentioned in my presentation of a kind of a joint information system. You know how we coordinate with each other, you know, in real time during an emergency to to make sure that those critical protective action messages are are, are reaching the public in, in a way that that allows them to make the decisions uh, they need to make. And you know we're doing some different. Uh, workshops uh, focusing on uh, uh, nuclear and radiological incidents, others on dam emergencies. And I, and I think those would be, you know, really good models for something similar for a wildfire hazard response planning as well. So, so thanks for the question. All right, thank you. Jitchi, the next question is for you. Does forewarn triangulate local weather measurement data such as wind and moisture with that of satellite data? So the answer is yes and no. So no, because uh, it does not do that at a continental scale that it operates in an automated fashion. 
but once we identify a region where we know that there are disturbance event happening, there are uh, there are people who will uh, will go ahead and and pull those data sets, additional ancillary data sets manually, and do an uh, uh, an assessment and then prepare a report to uh, to share with uh, with with local uh, forest managers. So we use that data, but we don't do this at continental scale in an automated fashion. Okay, thank you. Got him. The next question is for you. Does Oak Ridge have matrix models that depict the financial loss or damage due to forest fire at different locations in the U.S. due to transmission fault lines? Um, well, we don't have anything at this time. We get some some financial estimates from realty data set. Uh, so we've been talking to vendors to get MLS data that we can use towards estimating an approximation of, of what the damage likely to be on the on the infrastructure at this time. Okay, thank you. So the next question is for Jitu and Fang. Um, are Forewarn and Fang's platform related at all? Uh, so this is G2 um, and uh, no, uh, we are not related at all. As of now, yeah, I, I think not related. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see, David. Does well consider water resources and rate of water flow and past actual flood data? Yeah, we we do do a number of hindcasts, so grabbing observational data and run specific events. We typically focus on the more extreme events, so like think. Uh, like hurricane events, um, but as I, I mentioned, our all of our river rain simulations that we uh, have populated in the well are based on historical observations. I guess the the nuance there is we develop frequency distributions rather than specific events, and we're, so we're developing more of a probabilistic uh, representation of a flood extent. But but short answer is we we can develop any any number of hindcasts for any event. Okay, and the next question is also for you. Um, does well also model flooding in tributaries due to ice formations on entry to main rivers? Short answer is ice formation, no, um, but there is a way to represent obstructions like you might get from ice in, in the capabilities that populate data in the well. So um, it's something that can be done kind of uh, heuristically rather than explicitly modeling ice. Okay, thank you. Uh, got a next question is for you relative to non authoritative tweets or similar semi spatial noisy inputs. Are there generalized best practices or even ML models which have proven successful in generating reliable time critical information while filtering out false positives? Yes, that's actually a really great question and it's it's important to kind of um, estimate. Uh, the false positives and false negatives uh, while working with the machine learning model. And the really uh, the core of doing uh, is embedded in building a good code book. A code book would basically captures the nuances of how people talk during natural disasters. What are the what are the framing narratives there are during certain kinds of natural disasters? So people when talk about floods is different from people talk about wildfires. So um, a lot of our qualitative scientists are basically spending hours and hours to build this code book, which informs our machine learning models. And when we do data labeling uh, for supervised machine learning models, would that code book as a it's kind of like a dictionary, or I would say like an, an hierarchical dictionary or uh, <clears throat> embedding into the model, uh, which improves uh, our detection of machine learning. The second part of of this is. As new events and activities happen, it's it's important to kind of continuously update this code book. But at the same time, when when some of the things happened before uh, and the words are fairly new, it's important to create a human in loop approach towards um, putting some kind of a trust and confidence in the data. So, so the architecture that we built uh, does uh, include. Uh, a team of geospatial scientists who, during uh, critical times, evaluate and uh, put these um, 
confidence interval within the data. So that's kind of one approach. The second is we rarely rely only on one data point. We always talk, uh, create and rely on like numbers. So if people are talking about uh, a certain event or a certain activity, it's likely going to be true. And then we not only use like a one source, but more than one source. So not only, for example, Facebook is talking about the same thing, is likely that Foursquare is also talking about the same thing, but also like besides text scan, are we getting any um, ground photos? You know, people people take pictures and they share that information. So um, it's really a combination of coming up with the data fusion strategies to provide some kind of a confidence interval towards improving our understanding of machine learning. So machine learning in itself is just not about detecting or classification, but but also a large part of that building the code book, uh, creating more than one line of evidences, and then also human in loop processes to really uh, create a more compelling reason for policymakers uh, in that way. Great, thank you. I'm gonna try to get more questions in here. Uh, Ken, uh, does Sandia have models or understanding of fire and its physics from energized fallen transmission line conductor onto ground or vegetation? Uh, we don't, right? At presently, we have model where are the model work that we're actually in development of uh, just looks at the uh, immediate vicinity of, like, say, a combiner box or an inverter, and just to understand what the zone of influence is just around that area. Our models also look at AC fires just around, like, uh, switchgear equipment, but we haven't extended it uh, beyond that. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm hoping with future funding, we can uh, extend the model to also see the impact of secondary uh, hazards analysis, uh, such as with vegetation and other areas. All right, thank you. Uh, David, I'm going to ask you this next question. Uh, it seems like there's crossover with other agencies regarding wildfires and flooding. Do you have processes in place to collaborate with NOAA, the National Weather Service, uh, to test your output for potential transition to operations? Yeah, good, good question. Yes, there's, there is a lot of crossover and we do a fair bit of coordination. And it's generally through, I guess, what would be called the IRIS and I, I won't try and spell out what the IRIS stands for, but it's a federal interagency coordination council between uh, for, for flooding and it consists of USGS, uh, FEMA, Corps of Engineers, National Weather Service, and in particular, the National Water Center. And so we do coordinate um, with them a fair bit and we, we share information um, for example, when we run simulations, we share that information across that uh, interagency. Very good. All right, thank you so much. Um, we are coming to the end of time today. Um, I want to thank all of the panelists for your time, your energy, all of the great ideas that you brought forth today. We really appreciate it. We have posted the presentation from last week's webinar on the wildfire webinar series uh, website and a PDF of today's presentation will also be on that page by Monday and a recording of the presentation should be available later this week. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, if you have not already done so, please do register for our final two webinars to hear more about the National Labs capabilities. Our next webinar, which is next Thursday, starting at 2 p.m. Eastern, is going to focus on modeling and analytical tools. And we're going to have speakers from Argonne, Sandia, and SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. Uh, the register, uh, the link to register is in the chat. And if you have any additional questions, please do contact Stuart Cedrus at DOE. Uh, his email is on the screen here as well. And thank you so much for your participation. We look forward to having all of you join us next week. Have a great day.